Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. My name is Deeran Babrat. I'm the director of the National Ocean Council Office, and uh, before that, I was the program director uh, for the Collaborative Institute, and have had a hand in in putting some of this some of this wonderful stuff together. Uh, there are a number of wonderful folks and tremendous learning opportunities and experiences here. The thing that I'm most proud of as a surfer in Massachusetts uh, is, is, the, is the insight that I had uh, one morning thinking about what would be, what would be a wonderful touch to add to, uh, to the conference. And uh, so I had the opportunity to call, uh, which was a little intimidating because I've been following his blogs for 15 years. Uh, I picked up the phone and called Jeff Masters. And uh, from day one, he, he jumped at the opportunity and uh, is, is with us this afternoon to present on the 10 potential $100 billion weather disasters of the next 30 years. Uh, Jeff grew up in suburban Detroit, attended the University of Michigan, received his BS and master's degrees in meteorology. While working on his master's degree, he participated in field programs studying acid rain in the northeast U.S. and air pollution in the Detroit area. Uh, for folks who love storms and weather like me and like a lot of you out there, more to the point, uh, he was a former hurricane hunter, and part of his presentation will also be this afternoon a discussion of his experiences flying into Hurricane Hugo. So without further ado, Dr. Jeff Masters. Thank you, Darren. I'm going to talk a little bit today about hurricane hunting, like uh, Darren was saying, and I'm also going to talk about low probability, high impact events. And uh, I had my own version of uh, uh, a low probability event trying to get here last night flying to uh, Boston while my plane got canceled for mechanical problem. And then this morning, uh, got on the plane and, uh, well, it had a flat tire, so they took us off, and uh, I just landed at Logan about 12.05 uh, this afternoon, and so here I am uh, getting ready to uh, talk to you guys. So I got to uh, cue up text box on the bottom, okay. Here we go. <laughs> All right, so I'm good here. Need to get it up there. Ah, there we go. And uh, well, in honor of the concert, or in honor of this conference, uh, I've added two more potential $100 billion disasters that I. Uh, came up with that I thought uh, would possibly be something we could look at in the next 30 years. And well, I'll first of all I'll talk about hurricane hunting and then we'll talk a little bit more about disasters. For those of you who don't know me, I write probably what's the internet's most popular weather blog and wonderground.com is my website. You can see the little logo there. Here's what my blog looks like. Uh, this is a sample picture from Hurricane Irene last year. During Hurricane Irene's one week march up the coast towards New England, my blog averaged about 600,000 page views a day. Uh, this time of year I get about 80,000 page views a day, so it is quite popular blog. One of the features I'm most proud of on our website is something we added just this year. We have a local climate change page where you can go to your city and find out, well, what has the temperature done the last 100 years? So here for Reading, Massachusetts, I plot up for the last 100 years, since 1895, the temperature, and temperatures increased 1.6 degrees in the last century in the Boston area. And you can see in the red and the yellow lines up there where we think we're gonna head depending on how much CO2 we put in the atmosphere high emission scenario in red, low, and yellow. So that's just one sampler of the features we have on our website, uh, in addition to my blog, and you can just type in a zip code and get a forecast. 
Before I founded Weather Underground, I spent four years with the hurricane hunters out of Miami, Florida on the NOAA P3s, which are state-of-the-art flying laboratories that we outfitted with about $20 million worth of specialized equipment, including airborne Doppler radars, gust probes, cloud physics sensors, and drop sons. While I was in the Hurricane Hunters, it was from 1986 to 1990, I had the opportunity to fly through Hurricane Gilbert, which at the time was the strongest hurricane ever recorded until Wilma beat the record. And you can see a picture here of the eye of Gilbert. And what you're looking at on the surface there, that whitish kind of streaky, that's a 185 mile per hour sustained winds, which we measured in the eye wall of Gilbert as we were flying through it. We didn't do just hurricane work. In the winter, we'd go to the Arctic. So it was kind of the, the meteorologist's dream job. In the winter, you go to the Arctic. In the summer, you're in the tropics flying hurricanes. But dream jobs sometimes have nightmares. And we certainly had a nightmarish experiment flying th through Hurricane Hugo. That's the uh, not hyped version of the Barbados's, Barbados uh, news rider that was uh, flying on our airplane that day back in 1989. For those of you uh, who aren't familiar with Hurricane Hugo, this was back in 1989 and it hit South Carolina, and at the time it was the most expensive hurricane in history. Did um, about $7 billion of damage in those 1989 dollars. But before it hit South Carolina, it went through the islands, and I happened to catch it when we were out near Barbados, when the storm was at its peak intensity. Now, Here's a shot from the cockpit of the P-3 looking out at the runway at the uh, other P-3 getting ready to fly. And here we are taking off, looking at Barbados as we fly away. Now, the idea about hurricane flying is you want to measure the strongest winds that is safely possible to do so. And that means flying through the most intense part of the hurricane. You don't fly up and over the eye wall into the eye, like some people ask me. You fly you know, through the eye wall and try and measure those winds. Now, the reason you do that is because satellites really don't have a very good view of storms. Uh, I mean, you gotta see through clouds and measure indirectly what the winds are. If you can actually put an airplane into a storm and directly measure those winds, you have a much better idea of how strong that storm is. And a lot of times you'll see satellite estimates are off by a full category. I mean, a category three might actually be a category four, or category three might actually be a category five, which is what happened in Hugo. So we were the first airplane to intercept Hurricane Hugo. And this is the kind of scene you see as you approach the storm. You can see up above the cirrus shield of the outflow from the storm going over you, and then down below the kind of popcorn cumulus as the storm's convection fires up. Now as you get closer to the first spiral band, you see a little bit more vertical development in the clouds. And then this is what a spiral band looks like as you're approaching it. At, uh, we were at 10,000 feet here. Now, as we penetrated the first spiral band of Hurricane Hugo, this was the view of the ocean surface below. Those are sustained winds of about 80 miles per hour, which is about what we expected to see as we were flying into the storm. Now, here's the radar shot of Hugo that we had as we were approaching it. The intensity estimate from satellites that we got when we were heading out there said it was a category three with 125 mile an hour winds. Now, the fact that there hadn't been any other airplanes in the storm yet meant that, okay, we were the guinea pigs. We were gonna go in first and figure out, okay, how strong really is this storm? And what we did is we chopped through that first spiral band, which you can see on the image here in the lower left side. We came in from the southwest, and then we flew into that donut there, which is the eye wall of very intense echoes. You can see on the decibel scale, uh, we're a little bit off scale there. We're in the white area. Uh, which is one of the problems that uh, we should have noticed as we were flying into it. It was off scale, and we should have corrected our intensity readings there to see really how strong those echoes were. But as you can see, we flew right through the southwest part of it, which is the most intense echoes on the storm. Okay, now as you fly into the eye wall of a hurricane, 
it's too turbulent really to do anything if you screw up and go in too low. Now, remember, the idea is to go in at the lowest safe altitude. Well, what is the lowest safe altitude? It varies. In a major hurricane, category three and stronger, the rule generally is you go in at 10,000 feet. Sometimes you go in at 5,000 if you have a really important data set you want to take, which was the case this time. Uh, and actually, we decided we were going to be brave and go in at 1,500 feet, which is quite rare to do in an intense hurricane. But we had done it the previous week in another hurricane called Gabrielle, and we were feeling lucky. Well, we didn't get lucky. So we punched into the eye wall. And once you're in the eye wall, you're committed. That airplane cannot change altitudes, because it's all the pilots can do to just to control the aircraft and keep it flying straight and level in turbulence. So this is a shot of uh, some of the turbulence that we were hitting going into the eye wall. As soon as we hit it, boom, it gets dark, and you get this drumming sound of rain on the fuselage, and it gets loud, and the plane starts rocking back and forth. And as soon as we did hit this, we knew we were in a little bit of trouble, because the winds immediately hit 150 miles per hour, which is category four. We thought we were in a three, okay, we're in a four. We decide, okay, as soon as we get through the eye wall, we're gonna climb when we're in the eye to you know, 10,000 feet, because it's not good to be in a category four at 1,500 feet. Now, it only takes two minutes to get through the eye wall, so we just had to gut it out, hang on, which we did. And now, about halfway through the eye wall is when we started seeing things flying around the inside of the cabin. We're hitting three Gs of acceleration in the downward direction. We're hitting zero Gs going the opposite direction. We're hitting these huge updrafts and downdrafts, which are uh, carrying a lot of uh, momentum with them. So uh, we're getting uh, quite a bit concerned now because we still got a minute to go to get to the eye where it's calm. And now the winds are 160 miles per hour. That's category five. So the satellite estimates were off two full Saffir-Simpson categories, which is you know, why you fly into these storms. You want to figure out how strong they are. So we had no choice but to gut it out and, and keep on going, which we did. And now it's getting even rougher. Uh, we're hitting 180 mile per hour winds, 185 mile per hour winds in the horizontal. And the, the updrafts and downdrafts are getting even more intense. And we're hitting uh, like four Gs of acceleration and minus one. Uh, so it is getting dangerous around inside the cockpit now, inside the cabin, because things are flying around that weren't tied down very well, like flight bags and clipboards, things like that. But um, finally, we're two minutes through. You can start to see a little bit of light you know, in front of us. We're about to hit to the eye, and we're saying, hallelujah, you know, we, we did it. We punched through a Category 5 hurricane at 1,500 feet, and we made it. So just as we were, you know, saying, whoo, whoo, waha, we made it, then we hit the most incredible turbulence any aircraft has ever hit inside of a hurricane and survived. We hit 5.7 Gs in the downward direction. Now, the wings are supposed to tear off at six. And then in the other direction, we hit uh, minus three. So everything that was remotely not tied well into the uh, aircraft was flying loose. The, uh, the soda cans in the soda machine, or, or the cooler in the back, were flying around. The, the contents of the tool chests that we carry, screwdrivers and knives and stuff, were flying around inside. Our 200-pound life raft breaks loose and hits the ceiling and crashes down. A computer ripped off from its mooring and tore a gash in the ceiling. And right at that moment, the number three engine didn't get enough airflow because it was like a, a vacuum. The, the, forces of the uh, wind were so intense it created a vacuum on the one wing. Uh, the air aircraft's engine burst into flame. Pilot lost control of the aircraft, and we started plunging downward at a steep angle. Fortunately, we were right at the edge of the eye, and just we kind of coasted into the eye. The pilot was able to pull us out of our dive, extinguish the fire in the engine, and we were 800 feet above the waves in the eye of Category 5 Hurricane Hugo. This is the scene inside the eye. Uh, I had my camera with me and with a wide angle lens and took pictures. Uh, you can see you're kind of in a prison. You're surrounded on all sides by this, this white wall. Down below you, there's the ocean with 50 foot high waves crashing into, into each other. And then you've got the blue sky and the sun above. It's quite an awe inspiring sight and, and quite terrifying if you're in the center of one of these with only three engines and you barely made it in with four. So we circled inside the eye, which was very tight. It was about 10 mile diameter eye. And this is the scene 
Inside, you can see that life raft, that 200-pound life raft lying there in the middle of the cabin, little paper lying from the computer that got torn loose. You can see a gash in the ceiling where the computer hit the ceiling. This is the galley where all the uh, knives and forks and food and stuff were flying around. And what we did is something very non-ecological. We uh, dumped a lot of fuel in the ocean. So while we were circling inside the eye, we tried to lighten the aircraft to try and get as high as possible because the turbulence is generally less intense the higher you go in a hurricane. So we said, you know, let's lighten the load. Uh, we dumped half of our fuel load. We dumped all of our expendables in, our uh, drop sons, our air expendable bathythermographs. We dropped $10,000 worth of probes, you know, just in a few minutes and got some very high density data in the eye there. <laughs> And uh, we also gave a very uh, generous offer to uh, the Air Force airplane that was coming in to relieve us uh, to come in the eye with us and check us out for damage to uh, see if we were hurt worse than we thought we were, because we actually had a piece of debris hanging down from the number four engine. So one engine gone, another engine damaged. Uh, we circled inside that eye for about an hour trying to lighten the load and get higher. And while we did that, the Air Force airplane very bravely came in and did a close flyby. Uh, I don't know how those pilots did that, a close flyby inside a you know, 10 mile diameter eye of a category five hurricane, just remarkable flymanship they did. And they said, well, no, we don't see any other damage. Uh, in fact, the uh, piece of damage that was on the number four engine, or there, they, we had a propeller boot hanging from it. It tore away and didn't cause any trouble. And so uh, they very bravely offered to find a soft spot in the eye wall that we could go out. So here's a zoom shot of the eye. You can see our track there, the little circles we were taking. Now, where would you try and exit that eye if you wanted to get to safety? Well, look at the top there on the north side. Looks like it's a little bit thin there. And that's where the Air Force told us to go, uh, thinking that it was probably the best option. Now, at this time, uh, normally that airplane can get to an altitude of 25,000 feet. How high do you think we were able to get in the eye of Hurricane Hugo? Well, not 25,000, not 20,000, not even 10,000. We could only get to 6,000 feet. And that's for three reasons. Uh, number one, we were missing an engine. Number two, we were banked over at a 20 degree angle and it's hard to climb when you're banked over just because you know, we had to stay inside the eye, which is a tight circle. And number three, it's a low pressure zone. It's category five hurricane. The atmospheric pressure is about 10% lower than normal atmosphere. So you've got less lift. So three strikes and uh, you can't get very high. So 6,000 feet was, was all we could manage. Uh, the Air Force actually did uh, three penetrations through various parts of the eye wall, and th they got hammered pretty badly as well, but didn't take as much damage as we did. And then finally, their last exit through the eye, they went out that north eye wall, and they said, you know, it wasn't too bad that time. Yeah, the winds were 190 miles per hour, but there wasn't many updrafts and downdrafts. It wasn't too turbulent, and why don't you follow us out? So at that point, we were running low on fuel, and we had no choice anyway. And the pilot said, okay, we're going to do it. And... Uh, you know, he punched us into that north eye wall, and just like the Air Force said, uh, it wasn't that turbulent. Yeah, the winds were 190 miles per hour, but for whatever reason, there weren't very many updrafts and downdrafts, and uh, we ended up making it home. So uh, I have a, a URL there you can go to to find the, the whole story. I wrote it up, and it'd take you about 20 minutes to read. It's quite a good story. And you'll find, uh, well, why was it so bad? Well, we mistakenly flew through the nose of a hurricane instead of the eye, we decided. <laughs> Homage to uh, Gary Larson here. Okay, so uh, that was my last flight with the Hurricane Hunters. <laughs> I retired uh, that year and went back to school and earned my PhD in meteorology at the University of Michigan back, uh, this was in 1997. And in uh, 1995, actually, I founded, or co-founded uh, Weather Underground, which is the online weather company that all this stuff is on. And now 17 years later, here I am still helping run the company and uh, writing quite a bit about uh, extreme weather and climate change. So let's think a little bit about extreme weather and climate change and what could potentially be uh, the low probability but high impact type of disasters that we need to be concerned with in the future. And let's look at the past to give us a guide as to what might happen in the future. And if you look at all the disasters in the U.S. that have cost at least $15 billion, well, 
guess what? Hurricanes dominate the list. Look at how many hurricanes there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight out of 12 have been hurricanes. But also look at number two and three, look at drought. I think drought has really been given a uh, little bit of a short shrift. That's what I'm really most concerned with as far as possible impacts in the next 30 years uh, worldwide. Uh, drought is not exciting and doesn't get headlines, but uh, it's extremely destructive and deadly. I mean, look at the death tolls from those two droughts in 1988 and 1980, 7,500 and 10,000. Those are from the associated heat waves. Now, there's only been one $100 billion weather-related disaster in world history, and that's Hurricane Katrina. But look at those droughts. They're up there. They're getting close. $78 billion for the drought of 1988. So let's not be just U.S.-centric. Let's look at the world. Oh, first of all, I might mention that uh, in the early days, there was another drought back in the late 1870s that may be the most expensive weather-related disaster in U.S. history, a massive three-year drought and locust plague that pretty much wiped out U.S. agriculture for a period of years in the western U.S. Uh, and also, I shouldn't uh, scrimp on uh, talking about the Dust Bowl of the 1930s. Uh, that caused the displacement of 2.5 million people, cost over 5,000 lives, and was responsible for at least $8 billion worth of government assistance. We don't really know the true cost of that disaster, but another case where drought was a significant multi-billion dollar disaster. Okay, so looking internationally, uh, nothing has ever topped $50 billion, and in fact, there have only been seven international disasters that, uh, I'm sorry, eight, that have exceeded $15 billion, and uh, one of them was last year in Thailand, they had a $41 billion flood there. Uh, the other $40 billion disaster was in China due to a flood. So only Asia, the other continents, they've all gotten away without having a $15 billion weather-related disaster. All right, so we gotta think about hurricanes because we've seen that hurricanes tend to be responsible for these very expensive types of disasters. And we've got some serious issues with hurricanes in the future. The ocean is warming. I mean, the oceans have warmed uh, close to a degree centigrade over the past 110 or so years. And as the ocean warms, you provide more power for hurricanes. The wind speeds will increase. Now, it's not linear, the amount of damage a hurricane does. If you increase the wind speed by a linear factor, you cause an exponential increase in damage, which I'll show you uh, in a slide in a minute. Uh, you also can increase the rains by up to 20%. And the biggie is storm surge. Storm surge causes most of the dollar damage for these huge hurricane loss events we've seen. And if we increase the sea level by three feet, well, the estimates are we're gonna double or triple or quadruple the damage from a hurricane. So I did a little schematic here of what we expect sea level rise to be. Uh, the IPCC was low in their estimates because they didn't bother to uh, include uh, the melting from Greenland and Antarctica. Uh, they had good reasons for not doing it because uh, they didn't understand how much it could be. Uh, since 2007, we've had a couple estimates of how much sea level rise could be. Uh, I like the, the middle one there, uh, Ramsdorf, which predicts somewhere around two to three and a half feet of sea level rise. Uh, the other one, the, the light blue one going up to six feet, that's kind of a worst case scenario. If, the, if we crank up all the glaciers to their maximum extent and see how much sea level rise we could get, we, we could get up to six feet. But uh, pretty much all the glaciologists I've talked to think that's pretty unlikely. And more like three feet is what we should expect 100 years from now. Now, the U.S. coast is very vulnerable to sea level rise, and if you look in red here, that shows you where the most vulnerable regions are. Uh, they also happen to be where the hurricanes happen to hit, too. North Carolina, Louisiana, Texas, the uh, east coast of Florida. So we have a serious problem looking at, looking at uh, the future with hurricanes in respect to sea level rise. Uh, one other thing to think about here, hurricane damages since 1970 in the U.S have been doubling every 15 years. But hurricanes have not increased in their frequency of hitting the US. 
So that doubling every 15 years is due extent, exclusively to the fact we're putting more people in harm's way, we're putting more stuff in harm's way, the population's growing, and I think also sea level rise is contributing to that as well. So think about that, doubling every 15 years. So that says if Hurricane Katrina were to hit again in 15 years, it would be a $300 billion hurricane. Now, there's reason to think that in the future, we're going to see more of these category four and five hurricanes capable of causing the worst destruction. Uh, here's a modeling study uh, that was done by a group at uh, GFDL, published in Science. Uh, they're looking at the east coast of Florida and the Bahamas seeing maybe as many as two or three more of these most intense hurricanes per decade coming up. Uh, I should also add that here in New England, I would expect to see an increase in intense hurricanes just because we're going to warm the oceans. A warmer ocean has a better chance of allowing a major hurricane to progress farther north, which is something we saw last year with Hurricane Irene. So here's this plot showing the uh, nonlinear damage that we can expect from hurricanes. Uh, you know, a category four can do 250 times as much damage as a category one. So it's those most intense hurricanes we have to worry about. And there are model projections that those most intense hurricanes are gonna increase in number with a warmer climate, even though maybe the total number of hurricanes is gonna go down. So without further ado, let's launch into my top 12 list of potential $100 billion disasters over the next 30 years. Uh, I only included things if I thought they had at least a 10% chance of occurring. A one in 100 year event has a 1% chance of occurring in a given year. If you integrate that over 30 years, you get about a 26% chance. So if I'm saying I think a Tampa Bay hurricane is 20% probable in the next 30 years, that's a little bit less than a one in 100 year type of chance. So they have had two major hurricanes in Tampa since we'd started collecting records. Uh, it's pretty rare, but they're not prepared for one. They have a lot of infrastructure very close to sea level. And here's a storm surge map of Tampa Bay. And I'm showing you what would happen if a category four hurricane hit at high tide. This is a worst case scenario uh, called a MOM plot. And you see at the top there where I have that white dot that says Tampa. Look one pixel to the right of there where you see those orange colors. It's showing on the scale there that we're expecting a 25 foot storm surge, or at least this is the water depth that will cover Tampa. Uh, that's also the site of the Republican National Convention the last week of August of this year. Right on Channel Side Drive in Tampa, if they do happen to get a Category 4 hurricane, it will be 25 feet underwater there in a worst case scenario. Uh, note also that St. Petersburg will become an island. Uh, it's very bad news if a hurricane hits the Tampa Bay area, but they do have experience evacuating. They did a nice evacuation uh, for Hurricane Charlie in 2004, so they do have some experience doing that. I think they would get you know, the people out without thousands of lives being lost, but there would be a $100 billion disaster. Okay, let's not think just about the U.S. Let's go to typhoons in the Pacific. There has been a one category five super typhoon that's hit Japan in recorded history. It hit back in 1959 and uh, killed over 5,000 people. Were such a storm to hit again, uh, any of these three locations I show on this map, it could potentially be a $100 billion disaster. Uh, this is modeling results uh, from Peter Sassunas at AAR Worldwide, who's here uh, today at the conference. And uh, he equated these events to about one in 400 year events. And I figured that, well, we got three chances, you know, 30 years to do it. There's probably about a 10% chance J Japan will have a $100 billion typhoon. Okay, going over to China. Uh, remember, China had a $40 billion flood back in the 1990s. Uh, it's quite possible with the rate they're increasing their infrastructure and their infra economic growth that a flood in China will do $100 billion of damage. Uh, I give it about a 20% chance. They had, uh, back in 2010, I show here, uh, 50 billion in damage from a series of floods. So not at all uh, out of the question we could see that. Okay, number nine, Galveston, Houston. Uh, they had a hurricane named Ike that hit there, only a category two back in 20, uh, 2008, and that did close to 25 billion in damage. 
Uh, were they to get a direct hit from a Category 3 or stronger hurricane, uh, I think a $100 billion disaster would be very possible. So I got pretty high odds there, the highest so far, 30 percent. Uh, this is a big danger for the U.S. economy because there's so much oil and gas infrastructure in Houston. We got a lot of refineries there. We got a lot of ports that uh, handle cargo. Uh, this could be a severe disruption to the American economy if a, a Category 4, say, hurricane it makes a direct hit on Houston, Gabelston. Miami hurricane, they had a hurricane back in 1926 that were it to hit the exact same location today at the same intensity, uh, the estimates are do $140 billion in damage. Uh, Miami is the most prone part of the coast to hurricanes, so I have a very high percentage chance that Miami will see a $100 billion disaster, 40 percent. New Orleans has already had a $100 billion disaster. If we were to have a Category 3 or stronger hurricane make a direct hit on the city, uh, those levees would be at high danger of failing. They're only rated to Category 3 now. Category 4, they're designed to not handle. So I uh, give a 30 percent chance that uh, New Orleans would be another $100 billion disaster sometime in the next 30 years. Uh, New Orleans is another location we have to be concerned with as far as the American economy goes because there's so much infrastructure there for the oil and gas industry. And it's the uh, region where we've got our, four of our more impo mo uh, most important ports that handle outgoing grain exports to the rest of the world. 60 percent of our grain exports come down the Mississippi River. If you close the Mississippi, you lose 60 percent of our exports and a lot of our imports as well. It's going to cause huge cost to the American economy. Okay, another one to think about, uh, drought in China. Uh, this is a nice picture of a dust storm getting wrapped up into a uh, big extratropical cyclone. Uh, China's had some big problems with desertification in the last decade. And those problems are going to continue in the future as the climate warms. Now, the serious thing to think about with China and drought is if China can't feed itself, it's going to buy what it needs. It's rich enough to do that. And that's going to really drive up grain prices through the roof. And you're going to see a case where, you know, the Arab Spring type of food riots are going to be repeated if the Chinese have a really bad drought and can't feed themselves. So uh, this is a serious consideration here. Now we're starting to get in the top five. Things are really going to get a little hairier from now, as if they weren't already. Uh, New York City hurricane. I give only a 10 percent chance of a $100 billion New York City hurricane. But we came very, very close just with a mere tropical storm. Here's Irene from last year, which made a direct hit on New York City as a tropical storm with 65 mile an hour winds. The subway systems were only eight inches from being flooded by Hurricane Irene's storm surge. Now, at the rate of sea level rise we currently have uh, in the year 2040 or 2050, if we get a repeat of Irene, then guess what? You're going to have a multi-billion dollar uh, subway flooding event in New York City. Here's uh, Manhattan, Battery Park. Note the seawall is only five feet high. That's at mean sea level. High tide, you're only looking at about two and a half feet before the uh, surge comes over the wall. And note where the financial district is, also at very low elevation. Here's another one of these storm surge maps for New York City. Uh, because it's that kind of a funnel-shaped area, you can funnel in a very high storm surge. Uh, this is a Category 2 hurricane storm surge. We're looking at a 15 to 20-foot surge coming up the Hudson River and around Manhattan. There was a hurricane like this back in 1821, and someday it will be another one. So it's only a matter of time for New York City sees a, another 15 or 20 foot storm surge event. And with sea level rise ever increasing, then uh, the odds of this type of disaster are going to steadily increase. Uh, here's a shot of LaGuardia after a nor'easter flooded the airport in uh, 1950. And in 1992, there was a nor'easter that flooded a portion of the New York subway system and Hoboken, New Jersey's PATH train system as well, causing uh, hundreds of millions of damage. So New York City's already seen several storm surge events that have cost billions, and there will be more. And here's what could have been. This is a model forecast of Hurricane Irene done uh, a few days before it hit New York City. And so I was sweating this one big time. 
because four days before it was scheduled to hit uh, New Jersey, this model, which is our best model, the European Center model, was calling for a Category 4 hurricane with 936 millibar central pressure to uh, move into the water south of New Jersey. Had this forecast actually verified, uh, New York City would have had not just a $100 billion disaster, it would have been more like two or three or $400 billion disaster. Now let's think a little bit about if uh, maybe that hur hurricane had hit Boston. This is the Boston storm surge map. You can see Logan Airport there. Looks like it would go under about five feet of water. This is a category three hurricane, 125 mile an hour winds hitting at high tide, worst case scenario. So 15 to 20 foot storm surge going up the Charles River and the Mystic River. MIT gets flooded between five and 15 feet. Uh, looks like Harvard would be okay. Somerville would take a big hit. And uh, where we are here at UMB, uh, I'm seeing anywhere between uh, five and 15 feet of water submerging uh, the campus here. So category, category three, this is probably like a one in 400, one in 500 year event. Didn't make uh, my 10% criteria, so odds are this isn't gonna happen in the next 30 years. So I asked the question, what do we do about the storm surge problem? Well, in the shortish term, talking decades, we need to build some storm surge barriers. They've done that at three cities along the New England coast, uh, Providence, uh, New Bedford come to mind. And they do work. I mean, uh, these storm surge barriers held back the surges from several events that would have otherwise flooded these cities in the recent past. Uh, here's a proposed New York City storm surge barrier that would probably cost around $8 billion. Uh, probably New York City will wait until we have a disaster to build one of these. Uh, hopefully they won't uh, because it's gonna be needed. Sea level rise isn't gonna go away. Uh, we gotta protect New York City, which has uh, incidentally 10% of the US's GDP. So you bring down New York City, you bring down the American economy and probably cause uh, ripples through the world economy as well. Okay, number four is uh, called the Ark Storm in California. There was a huge flood back in the 1862 time period where they had a deluge of 20 inches of rain in just uh, a week. And the entire Central Valley of California flooded to a depth of 20 feet. We're talking a lake uh, 20 or 30 miles wide and over 100 miles long. Were that event to hit now, it would be estimated to be a $700 billion disaster. Okay, they get a little worse now. A U.S. drought is uh, one I'm most concerned about, and I'm giving it a 50% probability of occurring in the next 30 years. Uh, hopefully it would be at the lower end of uh, the billion dollar scale. Uh, and the reason I'm worried about it is because of food prices. I mean, we saw with the Russian drought of 2010, huge spike in world food prices. We're very lucky that the U.S. didn't have a mega drought the year after that, or world food stocks would have not been enough to, to feed the planet, and uh, there would have been huge political consequences across the globe. Um, here I'm showing you the, the drought indexes for the three biggest droughts in U.S. history. In, in the last 100 years, 1980, 1988, 1936. This is the Dust Bowl, hottest summer in U.S. history. Now, this is the forecast from the IPCC models for 30 years from now for drought over the U.S. So let's compare that with the Dust Bowl drought. There's the Dust Bowl, there's the forecast. This isn't even the extreme, this is the average so if you take the 22 IPCC models and average them out, this is what they say drought will be in the U.S. in 30 years. So roughly what the worst drought in U.S. history has been. And this is what they say it'll be for the world. So the top image is 30 years from now, the bottom image 60 years from now. Uh, we're talking about some really extreme drought conditions over parts of the world, particularly the Mediterranean, uh, the U.S., and portions of Africa. So we're in a lot of trouble if these predictions come true, or even close to true. But there is some room for optimism. Here's what those same models predicted that the drought should be for the past decade, and then here's what it actually was. So again, predicted what it actually was. They didn't get the Midwest right, and the models in general have some trouble with getting the regional picture of what global change is gonna look like. Uh, it's a detail, and they don't you know, get the details perfectly. So I'm optimistic that maybe uh, the, at least the grain growing regions of the US will escape some of those extreme drought conditions. But uh, the Western US is not looking so good. It's gonna be very expensive when Las Vegas runs out of water. 
Uh, I think I'll skip over that one for now. Okay, number two from my uh, top 12 list is uh, the Mississippi River changing course. There is a structure near the uh, Louisiana-Mississippi border that holds the Mississippi River in place. And it's called the Old River Control Structure. And here's what the Army Corps of Engineers has as kind of its uh, vision of what the Mississippi should do. And here's what the Mississippi really wants to do and has done in the past. So it's only a matter of time before the Mississippi changes course. It sees a path more than twice as steep and twice as short down to the Gulf. One of these days it's gonna change course. When it does, uh, it came reasonably close uh, back in uh, 2011 during those huge floods we had uh, that year, but the, the Army Corps built well, their levees held. But heavy precipitation events are increasing over the Mississippi watershed in particular. They've been going up, uh, you know, 20 or 30 percent over the past 50 years. And it's only a, the Army Corps which is keeping the Mississippi in place. So if the Mississippi River were to change course, it'd be incredibly costly. Uh, we'd lose 60% of our grain exports. It cost about $300 million a day when the Mississippi River closes. If it does suddenly jump during a huge flood event, uh, it's likely that it would take years for the Army Corps to dredge a new channel to get the barge traffic restarted. And until then, we really don't have the infrastructure in place to ship goods uh, upriver or uh, by, by train or truck to uh, relieve the loss of the Mississippi. So, uh, there's just a huge amount of industry that depends on the Mississippi as well that uh, would be, have to shut down if it changes course. So uh, finally, we'll go to number one, which uh, is one of those rare events that uh, climate change does not make more likely. In fact, it makes it less likely, and that's volcanic winter. Every two or 300 years, we get a big eruption in the tropics capable of depressing global temperatures and causing uh, a year without a summer, like happened in 1816 after the eruption of Tambora. So that's a, you know, about a 10% chance of something like that happening in the next 30 years. But as the climate warms, it's gonna be less likely that we could have that happen. Uh, here's our hockey stick graph of the uh, global temperatures over the last thousand years. Uh, you can see the coldest, winter, the coldest year in the last thousand years was after the Tambora eruption there that I have a little blue arrow. Uh, and also we need to think about uh, nuclear winter too. If we were to have the misfortune of a limited nuclear exchange, uh, say between India and Pakistan, uh, the uh, smoke from the burning cities could potentially cause a similar type effect. Uh, one could argue that that event would be more likely with climate change due to uh, water fights, that kind of thing. I, I certainly hope not. And uh, I take the uh, rainbow at the end of the storm uh, type of uh, view to this uh, scenario happening, and I don't think that's going to happen. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll close it up, and if you have any questions, be happy to take them. <laughs> yeah, I know it's a lot, it's a lot to uh, digest all at once, but uh, yeah. You should come to Michigan. Michigan's great. That's where I live. <laughs> we got lots of water. We got very few natural disasters. Uh, actually, the worst place to live is by an ocean coast, uh, the south and the southeast, and then uh, uh, North Carolina coast are the highest danger. Yeah. Those were our 2012 dollars. Yeah. 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 We know that heavy precipitation events are increasing in the U.S. Uh, the upper 1% and upper 0.1% type of downpours. And that makes sense from a theoretical point of view. I mean, you put more heat into the atmosphere and you've got more energy available to evaporate water. And when that water condenses into rain, it releases latent heat, which helps power a storm. So yeah, I mean, as the climate warms, there's the potential to greatly increase these high energy types of rainfall events. 
Uh, what's not known is how thunderstorms might behave because they need more than that. They actually need uh, a twisting motion to get them spinning to get the most severe types of thunderstorms. And the thought is, is that uh, that type of twisting motion from the jet stream uh, might be less prevalent in the future. So a lot of uncertainty there with respect to severe thunderstorms. But flooding rains we know are going to get worse. Yeah? When you showed this to elected officials, what did they say? <laughs> uh, I haven't shown it to any elected officials that I know of. <laughs> yeah? Yeah? Yeah, last year we had um, three of the top five greatest tornado events in U.S. history. Uh, that's pretty ridiculous to have a, you know, three of the top five in, all in one year. And uh, that's nuts. I mean, like I was saying um, before, we don't understand how climate change is going to affect severe thunderstorms. And their thought is that maybe, you know, as you decrease the wind shear from the jet stream as the jet stream retreats further to the north that maybe you would see fewer tornadic thunderstorms. But uh, I have to admit that last year it got me worried. There was so much uh, you know, off-scale type of weather behavior. Uh, not only did we you know, beat the super outbreak for tornadoes, uh, you know, an iconic weather extreme from, you know, U.S. history that's never been matched before. Uh, we also had the, the biggest flood ever on the Mississippi River, and we had the second warmest summer, and we almost beat the Dust Bowl summer of 1936 for heat. So three just crazy weather extremes last year in the U.S., and uh, you know, I've been a meteorologist 30 years, and I think we've just moved, you know, a notch up. I mean, the, there's more energy in the atmosphere. I'm seeing a change in weather patterns like I've never experienced before. And, uh, you know, it makes sense that maybe the climate has these gears that, it, you know, suddenly moves to a, a new uh, paradigm, uh, you know, a nonlinear shift. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised at all if, if that's what happened. Uh, but that being said, I think last year was also a naturally extreme year too. I mean, we get one in 50 year or one in 100 year extreme events naturally. So when you happen to get one of those years coupled with more energy in the atmosphere, then bam, you see unprecedented types of weather events. Yeah, hurricane intensity is a big issue because uh, we haven't really improved our forecasts over the last 20 years. The track forecasts have more than doubled in skill, but intensity has been very flat. Uh, I was at a conference a couple weeks ago where they revealed that part of the reason for that is just because we're observing hurricanes better. We know what their intensity is better because of all these new observing systems we've put up in the air. I mean, we've got these drop sons, we've got these uh, scatterometers and so on. So now what we're doing is we're seeing the intensity, uh, you know, in reality what it is, whereas before we had kind of a smooth idea of what it was. So in reality, hurricanes are very, very changeable. They've got a lot of ups and downs. And so now the intensity forecasts look worse than they really are uh, compared to the past just because we have a better idea that, oh, you know, hurricanes can be all over the place. So I think we have made progress that we're not seeing. And uh, I'm hopeful with the, uh, the, the current hurricane uh, intensity program we have, a 10-year program in place, uh, we got some pretty good modeling efforts going on now that are going to bear some fruit, I'm pretty confident. Yeah? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the U.S. has gone six years without a major hurricane. That's the first time that's happened since the 1860s. So maybe we're seeing the beginning of a new sort of steering pattern where the U.S. doesn't hit as often. Quite possible. Uh, but I like to say hurricanes are like bananas. They come in bunches. I mean, we saw the 2004-2005 period where we just got absolutely hammered. Uh, a period like that is probably coming again. So I think a lot of it is we're just lucky. But yeah, absolutely, uh, the patterns, steering patterns are going to change. We don't know how. Yeah. Uh, given the starkness and, uh, uh, and probabilities, how do you account for the indifference to climate by your fellow meteorologists? Reported, reported anyway. 
Uh, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? I'm not well, sure I understand. I mean, there's, there have been reports in the press that, that meteor, meteorologists in general are, have a very high percentage of, of climate change indifference. And uh, they represent an enormous uh, opportunity for communication. Uh, and, and, and if you believe that this is as stark and, and, and probable as it is, it seems to me that it's irresponsible of the profession not to deal with it. Yeah, there is some talk that the American Meteorological Society would require a climate change certification for TV meteorologists. There's also uh, an effort funded by the National Science Foundation for outreach to TV meteorologists. A fellow at uh, George Mason University is chairing that, and uh, Bud Ward at the Yale Forum for Climate Change is uh, also involved in that. Uh, I was, I'm scheduled to go to a workshop for TV meteorologists in Minnesota later this year where, uh, you know, as part of this effort, we're going to talk to them. So, yeah, absolutely, uh, this problem is uh, understood, and uh, w there are a lot of people working to change things. And uh, I think it's just a matter of we need to, you know, sit them down and say, hey, you know, look where, where you're getting your information from. You need to really look at the science. Yeah. Yeah, that's a big one. Um, you know, the uh, climate models are just beginning in the last few years to accurately show realistic looking El Nino, La Ninas. And as of right now, uh, there is no consensus that uh, the modeling community is willing to say, you know, this is what we expect El Nino to do in the future. So it's a complete unknown and it's a huge, huge issue. Yeah. Have there been an increase in the extratropical storms as well as the tropical? Yeah, there is evidence that in some ocean basins, the most intense extratropical storms, the ones with uh, pressures of 970 millibars or lower, have increased in number, uh, in particular in the Pacific and the Arctic. Uh, nor'easters, there's no evidence that there's been an increase in those type of storms. Uh, but in Europe, they have documented an increase in those types of uh, high impact storms in the winter there. So uh, yeah, interesting, the total number of those types of storms looks like maybe it's decreasing, but the strongest storms are getting stronger. Same kind of thing maybe that we expect to see with hurricanes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know Munich Re is very active in this, and they have uh, research work that they present each year at the AGU conference that I saw last December, where you know they're showing the total losses from hurricanes and how they're expanding. And uh, they think they see a signal in losses now due to climate change. But uh, there's been a recent review paper published in 2010 looking at review or reviewing losses due to weather-related disasters, and they concluded that the the noise is too great and we can't see a signal yet. But Absolutely, I would expect the insurance industry would be very concerned with this. And in fact, uh, I did uh, get invited out to uh, Bermuda last year and gave a TED talk there uh, to a bunch of you know reinsurance people, since that's uh, their big business out in Bermuda. They are very concerned with it. All right, with that, uh, I think uh, we have some words here from Robin, and thank you very much. Thanks.